Thank you. It really is a pleasure to be back here. I get such comfort from just walking over here. Um, I get to stay at a crappy little hotel called the Hotel Wales over on Madison. <laughs> if you want a boycott afterwards, I'll be over there. Um, just walking in, seeing Susan back in the green room, coming out here. Um, uh, the podium seems to be getting taller, but aside from that, I'm, I'm good. Um, I always say when I'm speaking uh, to the 92nd Street Y uh, crowds that I, I know um, I should be brief, that um, you didn't come here to hear me speak, you came here to hear yourself speak. Um, and so I'll try to get out of the way and um, let you indulge in what you love best. Um, um, uh, for people who've seen me before, or read my column, or, or see me elsewhere, uh, you probably know I'm a pretty bookish person. Uh, I grew up in Stuyvesant Town, not too far from here, and when I was seven, I um, read a book called Paddington the Bear, uh, and I decided in that moment I wanted to become a writer, uh, and, and I've been writing ever since. I remember in high school I wanted to date a, a woman named Bernice, and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. Um, and so our values, our values were different, um, and it wouldn't have worked. And so I was writing through high school, and then um, in, uh, when I was 18, the admissions officers at Columbia, Wesleyan, and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I did, you know, my, the famous saying about Chicago, it's where fun goes to die. Um, but my favorite saying about it, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, that's, uh, um, and that too is a bookish place. We had a kids wore t-shirts that say, sure it works in practice, but does it work in theory? Um, and, so, and so I spent a lot of time in the library. Uh, I majored, I did a double major in history and celibacy. Um, and, I wasn't like today's students, the today where I teach at Yale, if I ask them, you know, what are you doing at spring break? They say, you know, I'm unicycling across Thailand while reading to lepers. They're all doing this amazing stuff. Uh, but I did learn some skills that my students have, which is um, how to dominate classroom discussion while doing none of the reading, um, which stood me in good stead for my current job. Um, and then I did, this is true, I managed a boxer while I was at Chicago. Uh, a guy named Les Firestein who grew up on 96th Street here. He, we called him the kosher killer. Um, we didn't, he didn't, we didn't actually uh, practice boxing. We read books about boxing. Uh, and then his boxing title in the Chicago Golden Gloves competition, his career lasted about 92 seconds, uh, one uppercut. Uh, and I did, um, then I went in and a career with, had a lot of, of uh, bookish and commentary, and that's what I do. I do a segment called uh, Shields and Brooks on PBS. Some of you may know, we, we wanted to call it Brooks Shields. Um, that would have been better. My joke about Mark is that um, he's been doing this job longer than I. The segment is now called Shields and Brooks, and before that it was Shields and Gergen, or Shields and Go, and then Shields and Gergen, and then Shields and Coolidge. Uh, and I think it was Shields and Machiavelli at first. It was, goes back. Uh, and we do have a certain demographic. If a 93-year-old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's going to say. She's going to say, you know, I don't watch your show, but my mother loves it. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so you get to learn how to um, try to appear smart and appear bookish. Um, and I actually read a good commentary, if you're in a meeting, how to appear smart, by a woman named Sarah Cooper. Uh, if uh, somebody mentions a percentage while giving a presentation, you restate it as a fraction. So they'll say, oh, 25%, and you'll say, oh, one in four. That, that seems very smart if you do that. Um, so also, it also seems smart to construct meaningless Venn diagrams. So you say the past, the future, and the present. You say, we want to be right here in the Venn diagram. Uh, those always seem smart, too. Um, and so. I've lived this kind of life, um, hopefully getting a little more emotional. I've, I think I've gotten more feminine as I've gotten older. I'm the only man in America to finish that book, Eat, Pray, Love. Um, <laughs> by page 123, I was actually lactating. It's kind of amazing. Um, <clears throat> and then I wrote this book, The Social Animal, which is a book about emotion. Uh, my friends joke that me writing a book about emotion is like Gandhi writing a book about gluttony. It's not the natural thing. Um, 
And then most recently I wrote this book on character. Um, and I learned actually in the course of writing that book that um, writing a book on character doesn't give you good character. Uh, and even reading a book on character doesn't give you good character. But buying a book on character does give you good character, so I recommend that. So basically I'm underlining uh, one key point here is that you know, I get paid for being bookish and for writing. Uh, but I've, one thing I've learned is that the rational part of the brain is the third most important part of our consciousness. Uh, and the first is the desiring heart, uh, the need for intimacy and love and connection. I read recently about a guy who bought a house with a bamboo stand by his driveway, and he hated bamboo, so he chopped down the bamboo, and then he took a shovel and dug into the root system and took an ax and chopped up all the roots. And then he took this big bucket of plant poison and poured it all over the, what remained of the roots. And then he put three feet of gravel on top of the plant poison. Then he covered the whole thing over with cement. And two years later, um, a little bamboo shoot sticking up through the cement. Uh, and I think we all have that in ourselves, uh, which is our desire. Uh, we have something, we're just like existential sharks. We're on the move because we're always desiring something. And what we desire most fully is the desire to be connected, connected uh, with one another. Uh, in the famous grant study done at Harvard where they took these guys in the, from the 40s to today, the men who grew up with no deep love were three times more likely to suffer from mental illness, 2.5 times more likely to suffer from dementia when they were elderly, and they made 50% less money over the course of their careers. Our, our personalities are really wired by love. And we seek that sense of wholeness, uh, the kind of wholeness that Louis de Bernier described in a book uh, called Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Uh, he, in that book, early in the book, he's an old guy talking to his daughter about his relationship with his late wife. And the, the guy says, love itself is what is left over when being in love is burned away. And this is both an art and a fortunate accident. Your mother and I had it. We had roots that grew towards each other underground. And when all the pretty blossoms had fallen from our branches, we found out that we were one tree and not two. And that's what the heart wants. Uh, the second most important part of the consciousness, I think, is the soul. Now, I don't ask you to believe in God or not believe in God. Um, that's not really not my department. Uh, but I do ask you to believe that you have a soul, that there's some piece of you that has no shape, size, or color, but is of infinite value and dignity. Rich and successful people don't have more of it than the rest of us. And what this thing does is it yearns for righteousness. We all want to lead good lives and meaningful lives filled with purpose. I've never met anybody who didn't want to really want to lead a good life. Even when you interview somebody who's a criminal or has behaved terribly, they either try to persuade you that what they did was actually good or at least excusable. And so we all want to build not just a good life, but a, a, a yearning for justice. And sometimes it happens early in life, sometimes in late. I've noticed, especially with people um, over a certain age, that their, their life has this shape of two mountains. Uh, and the first mountain was the mountain they thought was gonna be their mountain to climb. They got out of school and they thought they were gonna be a doctor or whatever. And so they began climbing that mountain. And the first mountain is usually about building up the ego, establishing identity, figure out, out how you're gonna make a difference in the world. And they, sometimes they got to the top of the mountain and they found it unsatisfying. They achieved the success they dreamed at, but it suddenly didn't fill their soul. Or they fail, failed and got knocked off the mountain, or something really bad happened, like the death of an offspring or something like that. And they found themselves in the valley. And in the valley, they had actually a clearer vision of what their life is all about than they had up in the first mountain. And they realized there's a second mountain to climb. And while the first mountain is about establishing the ego, the second mountain is often about renouncing the ego. The first mountain is about building an identity and building yourself up. The second mountain is more about pouring yourself out. The first mountain is more professional and the second mountain is more spiritual. And you find again and again people who, especially in the second half of their life, 
have devoted themselves wholly towards some act of incredibly generous giving, some cause they passionately care about, some relationship they nurture, and they realize, no, I have a bigger mountain to climb. And I notice it never ends. And that mountain, especially in the second half of life, is driven by this soul, this part of us um, that, especially when you're young, is sort of like a reclusive leopard. It's the part of you that doesn't care about money or status or Facebook or, or any of the everyday things, but it feeds off transcendence and awareness of one's place in the cosmic order, a feeling of connection to unconditional love, truth, justice, beauty, and home. And for long periods, as I say, early in your life maybe, it's the leopard's high up in the forest, you're not really thinking about it. You're busy raising kids, whatever. But then there are spare moments when you feel its presence, you feel that spiritual ache. Sometimes it can happen in the middle of the night, you wake up, as my friend Christian Wyman puts it, when your thoughts are like a drawer full of knives. You have one of those bad nights. Sometimes it happens in moments of joy. You're surrounded by your family, and you're just overwhelmed by a joy that is greater than anything you could experience at work, and you become conscious of the fact that this is a joy you could never earn. And at such moments, you just want to be worthy, spiritually worthy of that kind of happiness. But then I think there are moments in the middle of life, late in life, where the leopard comes out of the mountains and it just comes right in the living room with you and it stares in front of you and it asks you for your justification. What's your purpose in life? What's your mission? What did you come for? And there are no excuses that moment. Everybody sort of has to throw off the mask. And some people have given these deep questions no thought and they have to live with that knowledge. And some people though, they don't, it's not a problem. Because at the top of the second mountain, they've, achieved, they've gone on the far side of selfless service. And they've, their self has faded away and they're just enmeshed in doing something deeply good for the world. And so that, these are the things that I think drive us. And our mind, our logical mind, is there just to sort of navigate. And one of the things people do with their desiring hearts and with their yearning souls is they want to build societies that are not just good for themselves, but where it's easier for other people to be good. They want to build not only institutions that help people, that inform and educate and care and nurture, but they want to build whole cultures. And collectively, we get together and we create cultures. And these cultures are supposed to help us solve the problems of a moment. And for the next few minutes, I'm just going to tell you about three different cultures that have succeeded in this country, built by people who wanted to solve their problems. I'm a believer, and I didn't make this up. There's a, a woman, a social scientist I read said, history moves forward in this process. Ratchet, hatchet, pivot, ratchet. And what she meant was, we ratchet up, we solve a problem, we create a culture that works. And it works for a while, but then it stops working. And we have a problem. And so we hatchet it apart, we, we chop it up. But then we pivot over and we create another culture that works and we ratchet up again. She says, never underestimate the value of human ingenuity to solve our problems. And you just have to endure the patience of those hatchet periods when we're chopping up the old culture that doesn't work. 1848 in Europe was a hatchet moment when you had all this turmoil. 1905, the industrial era, was a hatchet moment. 1968 was one, and we happen to be living in one right now. And it's easy to get disorganized. So let me just describe three of these cultural shifts. The first era I'll talk about was between 1932 and 1968. And people created a culture that was very group-oriented. Uh, they had to tackle some big challenges like World War II and the Depression. And so they had an ethos, which was we're all in this together. Uh, they went for big organizations like the Army, the Labor Unions, the IBM, and they lived in very tight communities. If you lived in Chicago in the 1950s, there's a great book called The Lost City about this. You followed, the, you probably had the same job your father and grandfather had at the Nabisco plant. You probably joined the same union they joined. In your neighborhood, you were part of this tight community. They didn't really have TV or air conditioning there, so in the summertime, everybody kept their doors open and the kids ran all between the houses. There was constant rounds of barbecues and coffee clutches and babysitting co-ops, constant trading of household goods. If they, somebody asked you, where are you from? You didn't say, I'm from Chicago. 
you said, I'm from 59th and Pulaski. Because your neighborhood was so tight, it was just that crossroads. And you served big organizations. There was a guy named Jim Fer John Ferry who worked for the Democrats' state legislature, and he worked for Boss Daly's machine. If you want to go into politics, you serve the machine. And he, he served in the machine in the state legislature for 20 years, and then at the end, Boss Daly said, you know, I'm going to reward you with two years in Congress in Washington, just as a capstone of your career. And when he was sent to Washington, they asked him, how are you going to vote when you get there? And he said, I will go to Washington to help represent Mayor Daley. For 21 years, I represented the mayor in the legislature, and he was always right. And so that's deference to an organization. And there were a lot of really good things about that culture. Really tight communities, real sense of membership and belonging, a lot of humility. There were some weaknesses of that culture. Racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, emotional coldness, the food was really boring. <laughs> and so people decided around the 60s that it was time to get rid of it. It was too conformist, too crushing of individual spirit. And so they chopped it up. And to me, the, sim the shift from one culture to another is symbolized by me by one of the biggest football games of my childhood. It's Super Bowl III in 1969 or 1970, where there were two quarterbacks facing each other by the end of the game, both of whom grew up in western Pennsylvania, 10 years apart. One of them was Johnny Unitas, who was like a 1950s kind of guy. Crew cut, high top shoes, boring white button shirts, went off the field. He, every, when he left the field after every game, he always thought of something boring to tell the reporters, because that was sort of the job. On the other side of the field was my favorite player of that era, uh, Broadway Joe Namath. $5,000 fur coats, he posed for pantyhose commercials, he had long hair, he was a swinger, he was anti-institutional, he wrote a memoir called, I Can't Wait Until Tomorrow Because I Get Better Looking Every Day. <laughs> Johnny Unitas would not have entitled their memoir that. And so that's a shift in culture. Suddenly it was favorable to be young, not old, Expressive, not reticent. Casual, not formal. Rebel, not a conformist. Individual, not institutional. The new ethos was individualistic. I'm free to be myself. And it, this ethos also gave us a lot. It was right for the moment. It gave us the civil rights movement, feminism, the peace movement, the age of Aquarius. I don't think we, we could have had the information age economy if we didn't have the rebellious individualistic spirit that came out of those times. And it gave us a culture I wrote about earlier in my career, the Bobo, people with 60s values and 90s money. And these are people who shop in the Whole Foods and the Trader Joe's, all the progressive grocery stores, where all the cashiers look like they're on loan from Amnesty International, you know those people. Um, <laughs> my favorite section of Trader Joe's is the snack food section, because they couldn't have anything like pretzels and potato chips, that would be vulgar. So they have these seaweed-based snacks for kids who come home and say, Mom, Mom, I want a snack that'll help prevent colorectal cancer. And they have, they have that. And so that culture was good for a time. It really created the modern economy, and it, it was just a, a much more dynamic culture than the conformist culture of the 1950s. But these days, we're sort of running out the string on it, and we're in the middle of another hatchet period. We've, become, we've seen the excesses of individualism, and it manifests itself in a couple of crises that are overlapping. The first is a crisis of isolation. In 1980, 20% 20 of Americans reported feeling lonely. Now twice as many do. 35% of the people over 45 in America today are chronically lonely. A generation ago, only 8% of Americans lived alone. Now 40% do. In 1970, married couples entertained friends in their home on average 15 times a year. Now the number is eight. The fastest growing political party is unaffiliated. The fastest religious movement is unaffiliated. Since 1999, suicide rates are spiking, and suicide rates, suicide is just a proxy for loneliness. 55 or 65,000 people die every year from opiate addiction, and opiate addiction is slow motion suicide. And so it grows out of that loneliness that grows out of individualism, maybe gone a little too far. The second crisis is an institutional crisis, distrust of authority. It used to be in the era of we're all in this together, 80% of Americans said, I trust government to do the right thing most of the time. Now it's about 
people feel alienated from their institutions. Worse, they feel alienated from each other. If you asked people a generation ago, are most people around you trustworthy? You would get 60% uh, say, yeah, people around me are trustworthy. Uh, now it's 32% and 19% of millennials. Distrust in institutions fell all at once between 65 and 75, basically Vietnam and Watergate. Distrust of each other falls by age cohort. If you're born in the 30s and 40s, you still probably have a little high distrust, a high trust for people around you. If you're born in the 80s and 90s, you probably have low distrust. Each cohort is getting less trustful as they go along. And as my friend Bob Putnam of Harvard says, it's not perception, it's reality. People are less trustworthy because people are less trustworthy. They're behaving worse toward each other, and that produces low trust. And the third crisis is a crisis of meaning. It's stunning to me that after all we've learned about the human brain, that depression rates and mental health problems are rising, not falling. And I see it in my students and I see it in people in their 20s. I've come to call it the telos crisis. Uh, they get out of school, they have a setback in their mid-20s, and they collapse. Nietzsche has a phrase, he who has a why to live for can endure anyhow. He who has a why to live for can endure anyhow. If you know why you're doing something, you can survive the setbacks. If you don't know what your purpose in life is, then every setback is crushing because you don't have some long-term thing you're shooting for. And I see the fragility, especially in the young, and a sense of a loss of purpose, a loss of meaning, a spiritual yearning that is, goes unfulfilled because they've been asked to find their sense of purpose, their sense of meaning for themselves and by themselves. If your name is Nietzsche or Aristotle, maybe you can come up with your own personal philosophy, but most of us need connection. And most of us find connection by launching ourselves into other human beings. And they have been denied that. David Foster Wallace, as usual, was ahead of the curve when he said, he described something that doesn't have much to do with physical circumstances or the economy or that stuff that gets talked about on the news. It's more like stomach level sadness I see it in myself and my friends in different ways. It manifests itself in a kind of lostness. This is a generation that has an inheritance of absolutely nothing as far as moral values is concerned. And so the individualism has created these three overlapping crises of isolation, of alienation, and of meaning. And what happens when people are left naked and alone? They do what our genes tell us to do which is they revert to tribe. They go back to their primal and fundamental identities, which are tribal identities. And the populists have understood this. I happened to have a, spend an afternoon with Steve Bannon a few months ago, um, and it was fascinating. It was like being with Trotsky in 1905. Um, <clears throat> but the guy had a total plan for where he wanted to move the country, Trump was only one part of the plan. He knew who his intellectual pasts were. He knew who the, uh, the international allies were, Victor Orban and Nigel Farage. And it, he had a sense of a movement. And, he un and the basic thing he understood was that when people feel lonely, they c you can't give them globalization. They want to have a sense of tight-knit tribes. And so the people who are rising, A, have a sense of the power of tribalism, they know how to expose the decaying and old culture. In the 1960s, there was a guy named Abby Hoffman who wasn't a great political theorist, but he was great at political theater, at creating plays that shows how ineffective the old system was. Sometimes I think, among other things, Donald Trump is just the Abby Hoffman of our day, that he's good at exposing the rifts in our country and poking a red-hot sticker into it. They understood how the culture has shifted. In the early part of the 1990s, I covered Europe and I covered the end of the Soviet Union, the end of apartheid, the fall of the Berlin Wall, European unification, Mandela coming out of prison, the Oslo peace process in the Middle East. It was all good news and it seemed to be barriers coming down, liberal democracy and triumph. The last thing I covered just before I came home was the Yugoslav Civil War. And I didn't think much of it at the time. But in retrospect, that war was the most important thing that happened while I was over there. 
because the tribalism and bitterness that it set off has been determined everything that's come since. We see tribalism now dominating our politics, negative polarization where people say, I don't really like my party, but I really hate the other one. You have tribalism de dominating identity movements on campus, and you have this distinct tribal mentality, which is a warrior mentality. It's always us, them. The core of life is always combat and conflict. Politics is war, ideas are conflict, society is tribal, is tribal, build walls, erect barriers, believe in conspiracies. You get this apocalyptic siege mentality that Donald Trump is so good at exploiting. Mistrust is their worldview. And from Donald Trump to the elections this week in Italy, tribalism, separatism are on the march. You see these surging illiberal movements uh, and I think it grows out of a culture that stopped nurturing relationships. And so that is the, the problem growing out of us is people's yearning to be in some form of relation. And if they live in a culture that no longer gives them a healthy set of relationships, they're gonna go for the unhealthy kind. And yet one of the things I've noticed, and this is especially true in the last four or five months, that people are stirring the people, you know, we, right now we're in a, th a cultural mode where we go from we're all in this together to I'm free to be myself to return to tribe. And yet all around the country I find people who don't want that tribal future. And they're coming out of their houses and they're getting organized. So over the last three or four months, literally hundreds of foundations and organizations and individuals have emailed or called and said, I want to start something. I want to do something positive. It's not, it's not about Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the wrong answer to the right question. It's to get at the things that really gave us Donald Trump. And I've, I've been so heartened by this outpouring of incipient activism. But I noticed a few things about these people, and me too. We're much more clear on what we're against than what we're for. We sort of have phrases, cultural pluralism, ethnic diversity, civic conversation, free flow of ideas, but we don't really have the kind of coherent, convicted movement that I heard in Steve Bannon's mouth. Second, we're dispersed and disorganized. We're just getting started, we're all over the place. Third, we tend to be defensive and demoralized, surprised by events, a little depressed, a little back on our fields, heels, feeling a little politically homeless. And of these groups that are starting, I notice they fall into five or six buckets. The first bucket is civic education. We have to relearn why we love democracy. The second is social capital building. We have to rebuild communities, create organizations that really nurture. The third is social mobility, healing the class divide. The fourth is depolarization, getting people on right and left together to actually talk to each other. The fifth is um, secular sermons, a sense of a crisis of meaning. How do we get the Heschels and Boobers and Reinhold Niebers of our day out to talk to the spiritual crisis in the country? The sixth is what do we do about the global world order? But what strikes me is that all these things which are now dispersed are all part of one thing, one part of one big effort to heal wounds, to bridge divides. And it reminds me a lot of the 1890s they were in a period like our own, economic transition, immigrant surge, corrupt politics, and within five years, after a period of disillusion and disgust, people got into action and they created all sorts of community organizations. Within five years, the Boys and Girl Scouts were created, the Boys and Girls Clubs, the Settlement House Movement, the Social Gospel, the NAACP, a lot of the union movements, the Temperance Movement, you had all these things coming together, and eventually they realized they were all one thing, the progressive movement. And they really turned around the country. And I'm hopeful that somehow together, we can bring together all these dispersed groups and say, we're all trying to heal the social loneliness that undergirds so much of our problems and the divides. So let's try to figure out what we're for. Let's try to hold up a better way to live. Because as you can tell, I'm a cultural determinist. I think social transformation follows from personal transformation, when people find a better way to live out democracy.
And to me, the ethos that should replace I'm free to be myself is not return to tribe. It's I commit to you. It's a series of commitments, a series of promises we make to each other. And it seems to me that we make four big commitments in our lives. Most of us do. To a spouse and family, to a vocation, to a philosophy and faith, to community and friends. And the success and fulfillment of our lives depends on how well we choose and execute upon those commitments. The way that Ruth did to Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Now, a commitment is not tribe. Tribe is building a community around hatred. There's always an other. Com commitment and community is built around love. The best definition of a commitment I know is falling in love with something and then building a structure of behavior around it for those moments when love falters. Jews love their God, but keep kosher just in case. <laughs> just have a structure of behavior. And so it starts with love. And it starts from a very different place. I, have, I had a, heard a story from a guy in Houston who's a hairdresser, and it's about a young woman who was living in Houston, <clears throat> and she was a pianist, and she was gonna go off and uh, move to San Francisco to be with her fiance. And she decided before she'd go, she'd get her hair done. So she um, went to this salon in Houston called Etude de Paris. And she walks in, she sees a guy cutting hair, and she goes back to the, where you put on the gown, and she calls up her mom and says, I've just seen the man I'm actually gonna marry. And so she gets her, puts on the gown, gets her hair shampooed, and she's sitting in the, the uh, chair with the guy who runs the place named David, uh, who's cutting her hair. And he's asking her um, what her life story is. And she says, well, I'm a concert pianist, and I'm about to move to San Francisco to be with my fiance, but I won't do it if you'll marry me. <laughs> and so as David tells the story, he looked at his scissors and he said, I never felt more free than I did at that instant. And he said, it's a deal. And they've been married 17 years. Um, now, not all of us fall in love that quickly. <laughs> but we do fall in love with things. Uh, to a husband and wife, to a vocation, to a career, to a faith. And when you fall in love with something, you want to make a commitment to it. You want to make a promise to it. The act of falling in love instills us to want to make a promise, to be faithful to that thing forever. And not only a promise, but a promise in not expecting a return. When you make a promise to love your spouse, you may get a return, but that's not why you made the promise. You make a choice to renounce future choices. In the Jewish tradition, we call it a covenant. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs said, emphasize the difference between a contract and a covenant. A contract is a transaction. A covenant is a relationship. Or to put it slightly differently, a contract is about interests. A covenant is about identity. It is about you and me coming together to form an us. And that's why contracts benefit, but covenants transform. And so commitment is a promise made out of love. And it gives us a bunch of things. Our commitments give us our identity. When you introduce yourself, you define yourself by the things you are really committed to. They give us a sense of purpose. In 2007, the Gallup organization asked people around the world, what do you, uh, do you, sen do you feel, think you have a sense of deep purpose and meaning in your life? And the country around the world where most people said they had the sense of deep purpose and meaning in life was Liberia. The Netherlands was last. And it's not because life was so much sweeter in Liberia than in the Netherlands. But to survive there, people had to make deep commitments to one another. They had tight, intense relationships. Our commitments lift us to a higher level of freedom. In our culture, we tend to think of freedom as absence of restraint. But there's a freedom for, which is to have the freedom to play piano, you have to tie yourself down and actually practice. Commitments build our moral character. When, I was, when my first son, our first son, was born um, in Brussels, he came out with a super low APGAR score. And the nurses took him away uh, to intensive care right away. And so it's one of those hairy moments where he comes out, he's all blue, and they whisk him away, he's gone. And I remember thinking that night, uh, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen to him. And I remember thinking, <clears throat> what would happen if he died after 30 minutes of life? 
would it be worth it to have a lifetime of grief for his mother and I? And if you had asked me that question before the kid was born, I thought, of course not. What's 30 minutes of a life that's not even aware of itself compared to a lifetime of grief for two human beings? But after, and I suspect parents will get this, after the child is born, you you've made this commitment to it of the sort you didn't even know was capable, you were capable of or existed. And the love is so deep that you totally get the idea, yeah, of course it would be worth it. The life of a child, even for 30 minutes, is of infinite value. And when you make that commitment sort of against your will, just because it just happened to you, then you start wanting to sacrifice for the kid. And you start, you know, I want to go out running, but I'll push the baby carriage. And you'll begin to do selfless. You'll be much more selfless than you ever thought capable of. Within the structure of commitment and the, the habit of selflessness will encourage and engrave certain character, def character traits onto you that were not there before. And in those way, in service to the things we love, we mold ourselves and become better people. And the final thing that our commitments give us is a sense of communion and joy. I've become one of the great blessings of my life in the last few years is that I, I, uh, every Thursday night, I go over to a house in DC with a, a little community. And it started because there was a couple there named Kathy and David who were probably about my age. And they had a kid in the public schools um, who had a friend named James who didn't, um, uh, he didn't have a, a mom who was really functioning. His dad had split. And so he had no food, no bed. And they said, well, James can stay over with our house if he wants to. Uh, and so James would come over and eat and stay at the house occasionally. And then he had a friend. And then he had a friend and he had a friend. And now when you go over to Kathy and David's house on Thursday night where I do for dinner, there are 25 or 30 kids there sitting around the table. And there are mattresses all over the floor everywhere. Uh, and I remember the first time I went in there, I, I reached out my hands to, to say hello, to introduce myself to one of the kids and said, we don't really shake hands here. We hug here. And I'm not the most emotionally demonstrative guy on earth, but they have a complete intolerance of social distance. And that's a level of intimacy and connection and community that is truly valuable. I have a friend named Bill Milliken who cut his teeth um, working here on the Upper West Side back when it was dangerous, doing youth programs. And he, I asked him, you know, what programs change lives? And he said, um, you know, I've been doing youth work for 50 years. I've never seen a program change a life. The only thing I've ever seen change lives is relationships. And it's creating those intimate bonds that grow out of commitments that's different than a tribal bond and different than the individualism and isolation we're stuck with. And the final thing commitments do <clears throat> is they give us a sense of joy. And I do think we're put on this earth to seek a sort of moral joy. And I've sort of been collecting quotes about joy of people who've experienced the depths of, or the heights of joy. And the first thing you notice about the expressions of joy is that it's always in unison with other people. People are rarely completely joyous alone. I had a professor of history named William McNeil who experienced it while marching with troops in World War II. He said, words are inadequate to describe the emotion aroused by the prolonged movement in unison that drilling involved. A sense of pervasive well-being is what I recall. More specifically, a strange sense of personal enlargement, a sort of swelling out becoming bigger than life, thanks to participation in a collective ritual. Rabbi Wolf Kelman was walking with Selma to, from, to Selma with Martin Luther King, and he said of that experience, we felt connected in song to the transcendental, the ineffable. We felt triumph and celebration. We felt that things change for the good and nothing is congealed forever. That was the warmest, most transcendental spiritual experience Meaning and purpose and mission were beyond exact words. Meaning was the feeling, the song, the moment of overwhelming spiritual fulfillment. David White, a poet, writes that joy is a meeting place of deep intentionality and of self-forgetting, the bodily alchemy of what lies inside of us in communion with what formerly seemed outside, but now is neither. Dance, laughter, affection, skin touching skin, singing in the car, music in the kitchen, 
the quiet, irreplaceable, and companionable presence of a daughter, the sheer intoxicating beauty of the world inhabited as an edge between what we previously thought was us and what we used to think was other than us. And so we live in a culture that is filled with isolation and tribalism and the anger that flows out of that. And many of us are stuck in that culture asking why and being appalled and being daily depressed and anxious. But I just have universal faith in ingenuity and Americans' energy to change things. And so I do think you see these good things all around the country and they all point in the same direction. They point away from isolation. They point away from the version of individualism we lived with. They point to communion and solidarity and healing. And I just happen to think that we're on the verge of something that will be a new birth of covenant for the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, if they turn up the lights, we have time for a question and answer, and we can talk about Paul Manafort for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for your words. I'm struggling with the difference between tribalism in, in the negative way that I think we all are experiencing it under, under the guise of populism. And on the other hand, the sense of strength and, and identity that we get from community, being a Jew, from being a woman or being gay, there are important ways of connection that help to build community and build relationship with others. And I wonder where that, if you have a sense of where that line sort of morphs from the positive of building relationships through identity to the kind of negative tribalism that's really rendering us apart yeah. so much these days. So I, my, I think they superficially look the same, but are deep down flow from different roots. Uh, and so, you know, you think, well, I want community being a Jew, being a Christian, being a woman, being an African-American, whatever. That can come in good and bad forms. Being an American can be a, a life-giving thing or a, a an, a destroying thing. And to me, it starts with a basic sense of security. That if you have a scarcity mentality, then everything's under threat uh, and everything is zero sum. And therefore, you're constantly making these friend enemy distinctions that you see life as a combat for, for resources which others are trying to grab from you. If you have an abundance mentality, then you do not see life as a zero sum game you see your life and your communities nestled in one another, and that you being a Jew doesn't take anything away from someone else being a Christian. In fact, you celebrate that. And if one of my heroes is Edmund Burke, an Irish philosopher, and he has a famous passage about the little platoons, which he means are the small units of community, but he's careful to say the little platoons don't exist in isolation, they're nestled in each other. The little platoon of the family is nestled in the neighborhood the neighborhood and the community, the community in the city, the city in the region, the region in the country, the country in the world. It's, it, it moves up by a series of ladders toward, and each fit into another. Uh, and so when something comes out of love, it just has a tendency to expand. Uh, Plato had this concept, which I think is the best concept of education I've ever heard, which is the ladder of loves. And he said, if you want to teach some, a student First, teach them about a beautiful face. And once you teach them about a beautiful face, they'll see there's a higher beauty, which is a beautiful personality. And once they see a higher beauty of the beautiful personality, they'll see there's an even higher beauty of a beautiful society of justice. And once they see that beauty, they'll see an even higher beauty, which is truth. And once they see that beauty, they'll see a higher beauty, which is the total beauty of the universe, the transcendent beauty from which he said, nothing can be added and nothing can be taken away. And it seems to me community that comes out of love and abundance just wants to expand. 
Uh, and it does, it does not want to erect barriers. It just doesn't want to erect barriers because there was always more to enjoy. Go over here. Can you talk about the millennials and where they fit in to all of this? Um, so I teach a lot. I just spent um, about a month touring from one college campus to another. Um, and so hey, millennials, the first thing I learned about millennials, they hate it when people my age talk about them. <laughs> Nonetheless, I have opinions. Um, the first thing that we said is um, the spiritual yearning is intense. Uh, as one of my students said to me, we're so hungry, we're so hungry. But the second thing that's so striking to me is how little they've been given by us. And so I don't know about you, I go to a lot of commencement talks, a lot of convocations in the spring. And the point of a commencement talk is they get a person who's achieved a lot of career success to give a speech in which he or she says career success doesn't really matter. <laughs> but then when you, an when you would analyze the talks, Students are coming out of college and they want to know what to devote their lives to, where to plant themselves. And we adults hand them these big boxes of nothing. So they say, well, what should I do with my life? And we say, be free, be autonomous. And they're like drowning in freedom. They want to know what to devote themselves to. And then they say, well, where should, they say, well, where should I go to learn about what I should do? They say, look inside, be true to yourself. You do you, follow your passion. The you is the one thing that hasn't been formed yet, so it's complete garbage advice. And then to add on the pressure, we say, the future is limitless, take risks. It's complete garbage advice. And so we have given them an inheritance of little. And the thing that disturbed me most about this recent round of interviews was, uh, well, the two things. One, a loss of a sense of nation. If you, I would always ask, who are your heroes? And that was always a tough question. There, there, none leapt to mind. Occasionally somebody would say, well, maybe Pope Francis, or a couple said Ellen DeGeneres, but it was tough. But if they did say somebody, and I said, well, who has credibility as a change agent for you? And they would say, local, always local. The local teacher, the parent, it was right on the ground. And then I would ask about the country, and they'd say, I don't really think Americans have a common culture or I don't really have much confidence in the country. And that's borne out by the statistic. Do you think America's the greatest country on earth? Boomers way up here, millennials way down here. And that's partly borne out by um, uh, their life experience. I was alive you know, toward the tail end of the civil rights movement. I got to see a really good thing. I saw this, the Cold War, a really good thing. I got to see America do some really good things. I, you know, I heard stories of World War II but in their lived experience, America is the financial crisis, Donald Trump and Iraq. So no wonder they have limited faith in the national project. And to me, the hardest thing, which I think has to change somehow, is what is our national story? I grew up, like many of you, I grew up, my family was four generations on the Lower East Side. And we were, I was raised by my grandfather to think America's story is an Exodus story. We left oppression, we crossed the wilderness, and we came to the promised land, and we're trying to build that thing. And the Puritans had that story, every immigrant group had that story, the founders wanted to put Moses on the great seal of the United States because they had that story. Martin Luther King talked more about Exodus than about the New Testament. He had that story, and I tell it to students, I did it at every campus I visited over the last month, and they look at me like I'm crazy. That promised land? This country is too screwed up to be a promised land. And so what's our uniting national narrative? The only one I can think that everyone that will have credibility is the Redeemer Nation, the Lincoln Second Inaugural. This is an experiment. It's been betrayed. We screwed it up, but we can come back. And that's sort of what Lincoln did in a moment of division. But they see the country nationally very different, and the, their categories of thought are very different. And as a friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Haidt puts, it, Haidt puts it, if you haven't been on a college campus in the last three years, you really don't know what's going on. It's utterly changed in the last three years, uh, in, in good ways, but not so good ways. Hi. I think you uh, did a wonderful job. I always enjoy listening to your speeches. Uh, 
I think, though, however, on the other side of the coin, what you're losing sight of is that America democracy itself was based on, like you indicated, community, people getting together, various places to meet, and worship, and so on. Uh, and that was the backbone of the historic picture of why times changed throughout history the way they did. I think with the creation of the internet, we now live in a world which is dr going dramatic, dramatically, very, very quickly, where you can really just live your life the way you want to. If you watch Fox News, as an example, you're living in a totally different world than somebody who's glued to MSNBC. I'm in my 70s, so when Walter Cronkite got on television, you, you had to listen. I mean, either, either you believed him, you didn't, or you would think about it. Now you don't have to do that anymore. You go to Sean Hannity, boy, he's right on, or Rachel Maddow, she's right on. So I don't know how you're ever gonna get to that loving place you're talking about, the compromise with the increasing segregation of, of people. Well, I, I like to think we have a loving place at the op-ed section of the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, it's, um, no, it's an excellent point. You know, uh, when uh, Gutenberg invented the printing press, uh, the initial reaction was, including from Martin Luther, was, this is great. We can all communicate with each other. Information is cheap, and we will have hundreds of years of freedom and a priesthood of all believers. But uh, the 150 years after the Gutenberg's press was 150 years of vicious religious wars because the central unifying information flow was dispersed and people picked their own ones and they had vicious religious wars. And Neil Ferguson makes, of Stanford makes the comparison today. When the internet happened, our first reaction was, this is great, we can all talk to each other. And the exact opposite has happened. Now, how, um, how can we combat that? To me, the, the, um, there are two problems here. One is the self-ghettoization you describe and I remember Fox News for a while, when this was about 10 years ago, they, um, they have these little chirons on the bottom of the screen. And the problem is that some people get up and watch Fox from 6 a.m. till 11 p.m., just Fox, and the chirons were burning into their TV set. So they had to move them around so it wouldn't destroy the TV. And so that, to me, was a symptom of like tunnel watching. And so that's one of the problems, just the information flow. The second is just the distance. It's sort of uh, online and social media communication is pseudo communication. It's not the kind of communication we have face to face. And so if you read the comment section of my, uh, on the bottom of my column, which I don't recommend, I used to do it, but I got so depressed <laughs> that I you know, wanted to kill myself. And then I made my assistant do it and he got so depressed. So um, we just have to shelter. But it's based on just vicious, you know, it's status one-upmanship. But if you ever write back, whoever writes to you the most vicious email, if you ever write back and establish a human connection, immediately they're polite. Because they suddenly realize, oh, there's another human being on the other end of this. But social media doesn't really encourage that. So it's not only the ghettoization, but the, the, um, the style of communication. Now, to me, the only way we can do that is, um, is through face-to-face -face contact. You know, I, I do think most of us, all of us in some way, have some responsibility as citizens to join a club that meets once a month with people completely unlike ourselves. Uh, and that, that, that's the only way I can see to get around this problem, because we're not going back to Walter Cronkite. Uh, and the, the, the hard thing is, there's a, a sociologist named Mark Dunkelman who says we have three levels of our relationships. We have our inner ring, which is our family and tight friends. We have our outer ring, which is our 500 friends on Facebook. But the middle ring is like the PTA, the Rotary Club, all the civic organizations that you, you get together with people unlike yourself to do a project in your community. And it's the middle ring that's been eviscerated. And so somehow the recreation of these middle ring institutions through civic engagement and through actual more participatory life seems to be the only way we can get around this problem.
How much do you think all of this activation or civic community is forged because there is a crisis? You know, I've thought about all these issues for many years, as many of us are if we live on this planet. And it seems that the most unifying events in history come from crisis. FDR, Churchill, all the different periods of time, the Vietnam War. Um, I worry that what we're having is an extended period of, I hate to say peace, because it's really not peaceful, but on our home turf, issues that are not really unifying because everyone has the luxury to think about themselves. We're not worried about taking our pots and pans and giving them to the war drive right. as people did you know, 40, 50 years ago, or rationing food. And so what frightens me is whether or not we're heading into a, a period of time that this disunification will lead to a crisis. And that crisis is what will somehow force us together or... Yeah. Or not. <laughs> or not. Yeah. So when you, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about when do countries turn around, turn themselves around. Uh, and uh, most of the time are in war. There's no question about it. Uh, but I've, there are two moments that I've read a lot about that happen in peacetime. And one was 1830 to 1848 in England. Uh, and in 1830, the country was falling apart, class divides like crazy. Uh, a real social decay, it was totally normal in 1830 to, for a guy to get drunk at work, go home and beat his wife. There was no judgment against that. But 1848, Victorian morality had kicked in and there was total judgment against that. And so what happened in 1838 and 1840? You had a bottom-down political movement to clean up government and to expand the franchise. And then you had a, a top-down reform and bottom, two bottom-up social movements. One was a movement called the Chartist Movement, which was a workers' movement, sort of a unionization, and the other was a religious revival. And both those things created all this cohesion. And then you look at the progressive era, which I keep coming back to. In, eight, in the 1880s, we were totally individualistic, and the culture was the social Darwinism. Selfishness is good. And that was destroyed by something called the uh, social gospel movement, which was sort of a religious revival, sort of left-right religious revival. And that turned around the idea that selfishness was good. And then once the idea turned around, all these organizations I mentioned earlier sprung into life. And then after they sprung into life, then Teddy Roosevelt made them political. So you had ideas, community politics in that order. And to me, we did it, that, that worked. And so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but getting the ideas right and the community right, and then the politics will be third. I, I have a guy I went to college with who was one of the major screw-ups in my class. Uh, he wouldn't mind me saying that. He, was, he would admit that. So, of course, he created a hedge fund, and now he's worth $18 billion or something like that. Um, and so he, he called me. Uh, I was with him last summer, and he said he gives money to big um, Republican uh, candidates, and he hates Trump. He gave a lot of money to Kasich last time, John McCain, Romney, whoever will be anti-Trump. And he said, well, who should I give to this time? And I could think of some names, maybe. There's this guy, Ben Sass from Nebraska. But it occurs to me that's the wrong level on which to ask the question. The, po the problems we have today are not fundamentally going to be solved by politics first. We've got to have civic renewal first, and intellectual renewal first, and politics then. Maybe two more questions. Um, thank you very much for this uh, very enlightening uh, speech. I, I wish you could talk a little bit more, especially since you were just discussing millennials about the education system. When I was a kid, we had to learn civics, citizenship, civic responsibility. In the state where I live, social studies, all that has been downplayed. It's not considered very important anymore. In my university, STEM is now everything. It's all a cost-benefit analysis. The administration's cutting back on the number of arts, humanities, and social studies students. So how do you address that when the university administration, or even in the high school, has said, well, we've got to train these kids for jobs? It's an expensive life out there. So when you really get down into the weeds, how do you deal with these kinds of educational problems? Yeah, well, 
having spent this month talking to millennials about what they know about American history, one of the women, a graduate student at Yale, told me, you know, in my high school education, the American Revolution, American Revolution was a rounding error. We did not cover it. And I, I came away thinking, whoever decided we should stop teaching in American history in schools did a really effective job, because it's not being taught. And really come, becoming radicalized in the idea that civic education is in a very important central step of what we need to do to give people, A, a sense of what happened, B, a balanced sense of our history. Yeah, we have a lot of shameful things that happen in American history. We also had a lot of amazing people who fought against those shameless things from the very beginning. And getting a balanced sense, I was just raised, you know, maybe my grandfather really had this immigrant mentality to think this, was, this really was the most amazing miracle that we've inherited. You know, what, there was James Madison, there was Alexander Hamilton, this Latino hip hop star from the Heights. Um, there's like, that we just, we were the lucky inheritors of Abraham Lincoln and Walt Whitman and Jane Addams. And to be born here is just to be born to win the lottery. And that sense, we don't have to go overboard and whitewash history, but that sense, I still think, I still tried to tell the young people, this is true. Uh, and it's not a lie. And so that, I think, is one thing that has to be done. We do need to work on civic education. The second thing that I think we've chopped out of our schools, I talked about the heart and, and the, the soul. We've chopped that part out. Uh, and I've covered education reform since 1983, since the Nation at Risk report. And the one thing I've learned in all that time, you can have big schools, little schools, charters, vouchers, whatever, but education is elementally the love between a teacher and a student. And the more you abstract away from that, the more you screw it up. And that one of the jobs of the schools is to teach students what to feel. Uh, and that what you, when you read Whitman, you experience his exaltation. When you hear Mozart's, uh, uh, you, you experience a certain emotion. When you read Sylvia Plath, you experience what sadness is. And all these things educate their emotions. They widen your repertoire of what to feel. And feeling is not a natural thing. You have to be taught it. I once saw Taylor Swift interviewed on 60 Minutes, and she was asked why her songs were so sad. And she said, well, there are 23 different kinds of sadness. And she said, there's your boyfriend leaves you sadness, and she played a little tune. Your cat dies sadness. Your mom is mad at you sadness. And she's an expert in sadness. <laughs> and knowing how to feel properly is part of an art to life. And you have to be taught that by experiencing these things through poetry, art, and music, and all that stuff. And the final thing, and this is, I don't know about you, I, I left my college sort of sick of it. <laughs> But I feel more attached to it now than I did 30 years ago, because I see more and more how it formed me. And one of the things my school did, it taught me how to see. See. You think that seeing is this, this thing, you just look out and see the world. <clears throat> but if you cover politics, you see that seeing clearly is not a normal thing. <laughs> it has to be taught. People see what they want to see, or they see what their prejudices tell them to see. John Ruskin had this line, the more I think of it, the more I realize that the most important thing any of us do is see something clearly and describe what we saw in a plain way. That a thousand people can talk for one who can think, but a million can think for one who can see. And that has to be taught by reading Orwell or Tolstoy or C.S. Lewis. People really see clearly. And the, I'm all for the STEM and the career prep, but we have amputated the students of their, we've just treated them like brains on a stick. Uh, and that has had a really negative, deleterious effect. One more question over here. Uh, thank you, Ms. Brooks. Quite a bit of your discussion tonight has been about tribalism, isolation, and I guess alienation. Um, what you're talking about, is it cyclical, or do you think we're living through a time which is sort of profoundly unique? Hmm. I, you know, some, I think, cultures change, and we do have periods of greater and lesser individualism, as I remember the 19th century was one. We have cultures of greater or lesser religiosity. 1913 was one of the less, least religious periods in American history, and then it went up in the 50s, and now it's going back down again. And so these things go in sine waves. I'm not sure I'd say it's cyclical. I do think there are 
couple things about politics. Um, politics is uh, a competition between partial truths. All big debates have some truth in them. And individualism and solidarity are two ends of a continuum. Security and freedom, achievement and equality. The big issues are usually two ends of a freedom and the, the, and the art of life is keeping a balance. And that's one of the reasons I'm a moderate. I rarely think that one, ant, one, uh, one side has all the truth. It's about balancing depending on the, the moment. We're just sailing on this ship in stormy seas, and sometimes you gotta re lean a little right, sometimes you lean a little left, just to keep the thing afloat. The second thing you learn about politics is that the lows are lows, the lows are lower than the highs are highs. What I mean by that is when politicians screw up, the bad effects are much greater than the good effects when they do something right. And therefore, it's important to be cautious and incremental. And the third thing I think is true uh, that I think we've lost sight of is that politics is a, um, a limited enterprise. I write about politics a lot, it matters, but I hope in none of our lives is it the most important thing. That the things that really matter are relationships, the state of our souls, the state of our moral character, and that you know, Susan and I were talking about this backstage about this um, poll where people are asked, would you mind if your son or daughter married somebody of the other party? <laughs> and in 1970, 5% of Americans would mind. Today, 40% would mind. And when my kids bring home a potential spouse, I hope my first question is not, what's your party registration? <laughs> but what has happened is that as all these other senses of belonging have stripped away, whether being a Jewish American, a Polish American, whatever, people have gone to the one communal thing they can still latch onto, and they've assigned ultimate meaning to your political identification. And once you do that, party becomes your ethnicity, compromise becomes dishonorable. And you, you can't have a natural politics there's a word for that in the religious traditions, and the word is idolatry, putting a medium thing as your ultimate thing. And the thing about idolatry is it seems to work in the beginning. That first hit of opium seems to work, feels great. But the more you do it, it works less and less and asks more and more. And so until the end, it asks everything of you and gives you nothing. And so we happen to be in a moment where political idolatry is the, the phrase of the day, and people think their rightness and wrongness depends on taking a position in politics. Uh, and I'll end with a couplet um, from a hero of mine, Samuel Johnson. Uh, he said, of all the things that human hearts endure, how few are those that kings can cause or cure. That politics is important, but I keep coming back to what has been my theme of the evening, was about connection, intimacy, relationship, love, all of the things that middle-aged white guys are very uncomfortable talking about. <laughs> Thank you.